Heavenly Father, thank you for the word of God and for your Holy Spirit. And we ask you to please come and teach us and give us understanding of tonight. Understanding of your word, uh, understanding of how you want it applied in our lives. Um, please bless all those who will watch another time and who are part of our study. We uh, ask that you would bless them as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Would someone like to read uh, Proverbs chapter 6, uh, beginning in verse 12? Let's do 12 through 15 first. I'll read. Okay. A worthless person, a wicked man, is the one who walks with a perverse mouth, who winks with his eyes, who signals with his feet, who points with his fingers, who with perversity in his heart continually devises evil who spreads strife. Therefore, his calamity will come suddenly. Instantly, he will be broken, and there will be no healing. All right. Thank you, Aaron. All right. What is the, the writer of Proverbs telling us here? What do you get out of it? As we read those few verses. Talking about a bad person. Yeah. Not people you would, you would want to be around. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. <clears throat> Someone with a perverse mouth, um, a worthless person, a wicked man. He winks with his eyes, who signals with his feet, who points with his fingers, who with perversity in his heart continually devises evil. Now, you don't want these kind of people in your life. <laughs> um, he wants to spread strife. That's conflict, division, stirring up problems in life. Um, instantly, this is what God says about someone like this. Instantly, he will be broken and there will be no healing. If you know someone like this, who this is how they live their life, their end will come quickly and there'll be no healing is what this passage is telling us. Um, the, the message says, riffraff and rascals talk about uh, talk out of both sides of their mouths. They wink at each other. They shuffle their feet. They cross their fingers behind their backs. Their perverse minds are always cooking up something nasty, always stirring up trouble. Catastrophe is just around the corner for them. A total smash up. Their lives ruined beyond repair. Let's... Uh, Let's now go to uh, verse 16 and uh, read through the end of 19. All right. All right, Eric. There are six things which the Lord hates. He has seven which are an abomination to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood. A heart that devises wicked plans, feet that run rapidly to evil. A false witness who utters lies and one who spreads strife among brothers. All right. So what are the, the seven things? The way he poetically says it, there are six things. Then he says there are seven things that are an abomination to God. So what are some of those seven things? What is haughty eyes? That's what I was going to say. It's haughty like you think you're all that. Yeah, it's pride, right? Yeah, arrogance. So God hates... Pride, he says that a lot in the Proverbs, by the way. He says it in the New Testament as well. God hates pride. Uh, we should not think more highly of ourselves than we ought. There's many passages where God hates the pride. And what was what was Satan's big downfall? Pride, pride. pride right? Mm -hmm. um, he, he thought himself to be equal to God, and that's what led to his fall. So pride is definitely one God hates. What's another one? I can't shed innocent blood. All right, so the line from hands that shed innocent blood. That that Murders. could go a lot, right? Yeah. So we got uh, someone attacking an elderly couple and, and, and murdering them. Uh, abortion, um, uh, a child abuser, someone who, the innocent blood, someone who did nothing to deserve it, right? God hates that. So God doesn't like murder. He doesn't like war. But he absolutely, an abomination to him is when we shed innocent blood. Um, 
someone who has done no wrong and yet we take their life. So, and I heard uh, Dad say a lying tongue. So, gosh, these are this is describing politicians. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say that. <laughs> I'll stir the pot. <laughs> um, so, a lying tongue. God sees a lying tongue as, a, as an abomination. He absolutely hates. A lying tongue. Any way that we are deceiving, uh, whether we're trying to make ourselves look better or we're lying about another person, we're bearing false witness. That's one of the Ten Commandments, right? Thou shalt not lie or bear false witness. So uh, these things are very important to God. We want to remember them. Uh, the shedding of innocent blood, the lying tongue, um, haughty eyes, having pride. These are big, big Issues and pride leads to many other sins. Lying leads to many other sins. Um, all right, what's what's another one that you see? Well, I was thinking the instant blood. I always I think of abortions right now. Yeah, yeah. yeah just millions, millions, babies being killed. Yeah, yeah. You know, and I, I was pointing fingers at the politician, but this is something for each of us. It is. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, I was saying that as a joke. Oh, I know. <laughs> it gets close to home. It, yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. Well, where it says a heart that devises evil, wicked plans. Right. I see what you're saying. Well, if you were to break that down in your own words, I mean, what, what would be an example of someone, a heart that devises wicked plans? Somebody that's planning something very bad. All right. What about, like, Let's go kill the Iranians. Something like that. Countries, you know, killing one another. Because you could say that. I think, um, I mean, if we, let's think about a, a wicked plan. So if uh, Columbine a group shooters. of Columbine shooters, someone who plans to go in and slaughter children Utah in an murders. elementary or whatever. The Utah murders. The Utah murders, yes. you got... Uh, people just saying, "Hey, let's go out and uh, let's go out and just beat somebody into the ground tonight." We don't have to know who they are. They didn't have to do anything to us. Let's just let's plan to do this. Let's go plan to rob somebody. Let's let's find a girl and rape her and kill her. This stuff's all you know. If you watch forensic files or anything, you, these things happen quite often in the world, right? People who devise these wicked schemes, whether it's theft. Beating, abusing, hurting, injuring, raping, killing. These are wicked plans. They're very evil plans. And God hates the hearts of those who devise these plans, who think them up. So there's a difference between a, a war in which countries are fighting for the rights of a people yes. versus the innocent killing. Yeah. Yes. yeah. The, the needless killing. Right, right. Uh, and I think that. To go along with what Eric's saying, uh, we could say that when Hitler decided to take over countries that had not instigated anything, that that would be wicked scheming and planning, right? But for a country fighting back to prevent and going to war is not wicked. It's actually righteous to do that. So, but it, it has to do with were you uh, provoked? I think what we read last week had to do with. Uh, Doing something to someone and being unprovoked. I think I would think we read that in here. If not, I read it in another passage this week. But uh, to be unprovoked and cause harm to someone else or to fight them uh, is is. I thought evil. about that. The first earthquakes in Turkey all those buildings that fell apart. Yeah. All the graft and corruption and buildings people got yes. paid off. Yes. Who yeah. Who got going over there? Yep. Not, not, not caring at all for any humanity. Or for their safety, but wanting money for themselves. They could have done the job right, and they cut corners for for greed. And that's happened. It used to happen a lot more in New York and in our country, but thankfully, people got sued so much that they uh, they stopped uh, for the most part. But yeah, you know, the same thing happened in Nepal when they had their earthquake um, maybe ten years ago or so, or close to that. Uh, they had built so just like. Pretty little brick stacked, and it just collapsed. 
Yeah. Uh, you'd have thought Turkey, much more de developed and westernized, would have had better building codes, but corruption. But well, they did. <laughs> well, the corruption, yeah, yeah, is what it is. Wicked plans. We see that in America, though, too, and you know, developing uh, in floodplains, and then yeah. you know, forgetting that that's that's an area. There's a reason we have green space. Yes, because you know, it floods, and yeah. it's happening even even here in the Metroplex. Right, they're allowing it to be developed, and it's going to flood again, and people are going to lose out. Yeah, and it's usually those that are impoverished mm -hmm. that yeah are going to experience that. Right, they take advantage of someone who. Won't be able to fight back very well. Yeah. Uh, feet that run rapidly to evil. What does that make you think of? Someone runs rapidly to evil. I think it's, in my mind, what came to my mind uh, was, I guess it's New York, but there was this one guy who would just run up and sucker punch people. Yeah. And just, I mean, just old people. Mm -hmm. Just run up just and sucker punch them. And then leave. Yeah. You know, and um, some of those elderly people got hurt really bad. Mm -hmm. I mean, you get punched inside the head or something right. by some, and that guy was big. They had they had videos of him. He was a big man. Yeah. So, I think I think of a lot of people that run uh, or you know instantly jump on the bandwagon of something like you know a great one we've already talked about is abortion. You know, the people that support those types of actions, mm -hmm. even though they probably know in their hearts through their church that they're belonging to one, that it is evil. Right, right. I think when you see the word running rapidly, it's, it's a, generally there's an excitement and enthusiasm. Yes. Yeah. You're wanting to do it. Yeah. And so it's not just you're being coerced or you thought about it for a while, you really struggled. These are people who run rapidly to evil. There's something they they crave with bloodthirst, kind of like what you were describing. Just that's what it seems to come to mind for me. Is I'm thinking of like when there's riots and then all of a sudden they light this building or house on fire mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and people flock to it. Yeah, running rap to just, running join rapid, just to join the chaotic. The yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So again, we see God hating this feet that run rapidly to evil. Um, and then we see something that is like a, a, a repeat, a false witness who utters lies. Out of seven things God hates and that are abominations, lying gets mentioned twice. Yeah. That, I think that says something to us about being honest. God hates lying. Absolutely hates lying. And then uh, it said, one who, last of all, one who spreads strife among brothers. And uh, I like the way that the... Uh, the message shares these. It says, here are six things God hates and one more that he loathes with a passion. Uh, eyes that are arrogant, a tongue that lies, hands that murder the innocent, a heart that hatches evil plots, feet that run, uh, that race down a wicked track, a mouth that lies under oath, and a troublemaker in the family. I like that last one. Um, I got one. One who spreads strife among brothers. So, you know, whether it's actual blood family or not, you think about this. So you have a group of friends even. And someone who comes in and begins to tell lies to pit people against each other. Or maybe does the same in a family or in a workplace. And it's someone who says that so-and-so was saying this about you. I heard them talking about you. Yeah. Then they go over to this one and they and what they do is they love to cause strife and division and anger and it's all based on lies god says i absolutely hate people who do that so um, yeah, it reminds you of uh, ahithophel who was the counsel to king david after david had reigned for some time and had older children ahithophel was the one that conspired to turn absalom against david and david against absalom yeah uh, but yeah that that intention to conspire and pit people against one another, even to the point of mutiny, yeah. so the overthrow yeah. of the throne of Jerusalem at that time, and then Absalom lost his own life. Yeah. And I'm pretty sure Hithophel hung himself 
if I recall that correctly. Just, I think you're right, yeah. Just kind of in the aftermath of all of that. Because he knew what was coming. Kind of, right. Yeah. yeah, but. Um, I got to ask, where's that at? That's in 2 Samuel. Okay. Yeah. So I think if you start really kind of in probably 10 or 11, David and Bathsheba is kind of when it takes up the narrative. Because it was really a pronunciation of judgment from the prophet Nathan, you know, declaring what God's judgment was for the house of David was because he had done such a thing. David's, I'm sorry, Nathan's words were, because you have done this, the sword shall not depart from your house. Mm -hmm. And so essentially that was kind of how it unfolded. There's just all this strife mm -hmm. and... Um, yeah, all of that stuff taking place in his own home. But yeah, just even how a person was used, the hit the fell sort of being a, you could say like a manifestation of Satan, and just the evil counsel conspiring, bearing false witness, right. all of that. Yeah. Brought much division and strife and suffering to me. All right, well, we already passed our quarter till mark, but it's good to get through this seven things. That's kind of a subject you don't want to leave half open. Let's go now into Hebrews chapter 6, and we're starting tonight in verse 9. And while you're turning there, I'm going to go ahead and remind you what we were talking about last week, because we need to know that as we start reading verse 9. So last week we talked about, uh, I'm going to start in verse 4 of, of chapter 6 and just let you hear, a lot of you will remember this. Uh, for in the case of those who have once been enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away, it is impossible to renew them again to repentance since they again crucify to themselves the Son of God and put Him to open shame. For ground that drinks the rain which often falls on it and brings forth vegetation useful to those for whose sake it is also tilled, receives a blessing from God. But if it yields thorns and thistles, it is worthless and close to being cursed, and it ends up being burned. All right, so we were talking about uh, those who uh, have experienced God uh, in, in these multiple different ways here, uh, but are like maybe the one of the soils where uh, the seed was plucked up quickly or the roots were on rocky ground and never could really get a good grasp. And so when the sun came out, uh, it died. Uh, and then the, the third one where the worries of the world, the weeds choke out um, the faith. So we, we kind of talked about different things like that. How, uh, and really I need to say this because this is about to be what we're moving into as we move through Hebrews. The last two weeks, we've talked about how important it is that we persevere in our faith, uh, that we uh, we not just be happy that we're born again and sit back and drink milk the rest of our lives. But what what the writer of Hebrews has been telling us, at least the last two weeks, the end of chapter five uh, and chapter six so far, he's he's begun to shift us in this direction saying look you should not think that you're saved just because you said a prayer because you had an emotional experience in a service uh, rather the fruit of true saving faith and I preached on this as well a little bit Sunday the fruit of true saving faith is works they will come out of you not works bringing your salvation not works making you a good tree are causing you to be saved. It's, you're not saved by works. You're saved by grace through faith alone, right? But what we've been hearing here is that there are there are going to be those in the end who said, but didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we cast out demons? Uh, Lord, Lord. And he's going to say, depart from me. I never knew you, right? Because there are going to be those who uh, had an experience but did not truly have saving faith they did not believe and and believe so that their lives changed and good works began to come out of them as i said sunday not perfection not sinlessness but a desire to uh mature 
a desire to mature, which is what we saw in chapter 6, uh, verse 2. Christ let us press on to maturity. And if you're reading a King James or maybe another translation, it may say press on to perfection. And that word perfection actually means maturity, not sinlessness. So let us press on. He says that if you're truly born again, if you truly experience saving faith, you're going to want to desire to press on to know God more, to mature in the faith. And so that's what we're about to get into as we move into verse nine. We, we talk. He, he ends by saying, uh, beware. This is a warning. Those who have, uh, you know, had these experiences with God, been emotionally moved, but really never in, in saving faith, gave their life to Christ and experienced regeneration. Uh, they, when they fall away, uh, will not be brought back. He says, verse 7 uh, and 8 talks about ground that drinks in the rain and produces fruit for those for which it was planted. They're blessed. But those who drink in the rain and produce no fruit, he says, they're in danger of being cursed. So what is it that the writer's telling us under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit? We should all be pressing on to maturity. What is maturity? Maturity is going to look like bearing fruit, more fruit. And that requires us abiding in Christ so that we can bear fruit. This is the evidence that flows out of, uh, that proves that we are truly born again. We've been made good trees. We're no longer bad trees. By the miraculous power of Christ, we have been transformed into good trees and Good trees bear good fruit. Bad trees bear bad fruit, and you'll never get a bad tree to bear good fruit. So we have to be transformed by the miracle working power of Christ. That's what has to happen in our lives. So what does he say as he's writing to the Hebrews? Verse 9 says, But beloved, we are convinced of better things concerning you. So he just talked about how some will uh, fall away. And not be brought back. Some who have tasted the Holy Spirit and all these things. He says, but better things. We are convinced of better things concerning you. Which says, though we have just shared this warning of what will happen to some who really have not been born again. Remember what uh, John wrote in, in 1 John? That uh, those who uh, went out from us were really never a part of us, Right? So we have lots of passages that talk about there being an apostasy in the church. But what we don't want to go to is believing that someone who has truly been given eternal life, that God takes away that eternal life. But rather understand that what has happened is and what is happening in the earth today and what has been happening since the days of, of, of the first church is that there are those who get emotional and are drawn in and get excited, but they really never put their faith in. In Christ and to experience salvation. Um, if they do, they will be transformed and they will uh, begin to bear his good fruit. So, verse 9 But beloved, we are convinced of better things concerning you and things that accompany salvation. It's very important to see that word accompany salvation, that go along with salvation. Because salvation was not meant to just be something where you are saved and it's all over. You're, you're now going to heaven, kick back and relax. He says, no, I'm about to begin to share some things with you that accompany salvation. Any guess as to what accompanies salvation? Starts with a W and I've been saying it a lot. <laughs> Works. <laughs> Works of righteousness. They accompany your salvation. <laughs> so um, we're about to see that as we go through this. Hmm? City words. Words? Yeah, because you don't you don't we clean up our words a little bit as we're as we're being and I think, changed? I think that could fit under a good work or good fruit. Yeah, yeah. The fruit of uh, our, our mouth being changed, everything. Yeah. Yeah. So he says in verse ten, for God is not unjust so as to forget your work and the love which you have shown toward his name. In having ministered and in still ministering to the saints. So how have they shown their love toward the name of Christ? 
in verse 10. How does it say they've shown their love toward his name? Ministering to the saints. What they have already done for them and what they are continuing to do, ministering to the saints. What I think of is what we read in the book of Acts. They're feeding the widows, the orphans, the poor, right? What does he say? Whatever you've done, the least of these you've done unto me. Right. So whenever we are doing good works and and maybe when they would send money to help Paul on a missionary journey, when they were uh, sending back to help those in Jerusalem, uh, churches all over Asia and Asia Minor were sending offerings back to Jerusalem to help the church in Jerusalem because they were being persecuted so bad by the Jews. They couldn't work and keep their jobs and their businesses. And so there was assistance and aid coming. And he says, uh, God has seen this and he is not unjust so as to forget your work, to forget what you've been doing out of the love of Christ inside of you. The love for his name that has caused you to do these kind works, these ministering works to the saints. He's not unjust. He's not going to forget. He sees what you're doing. And he talks about in different places in scripture, the rewards that we'll be amassing in heaven because of what we do here on earth. Anybody have a question before we keep going? I'm, this is we're building. We're going to be getting somewhere here in a little bit. But I'll... <laughs> all right. Uh, I've got just a thought. Um, in the very first few passages of chapter six, um, again, Paul is talking about those who have experienced. There's been this degree of experience, um, and he lists what those things are: the uh, being enlightened. They, it appears as though they had been enlightened. They had tasted of the heavenly gift. They were made partakers of the Holy Spirit, tasted of the good word of God, the powers of the age to come, but had fallen away. Mm -hmm. This experience, and Murray, I think, does a really good job of mm -hmm. kind of parsing each part out. Yeah. That, you know, there was a, an experience of emotion and right. um, an excitement, but it didn't yield fruit. Right. And I think what's interesting is Paul turns a corner. He says, "I, you know, we think of different things for you, things that accompany salvation, these works and fruit. And then he gives them an example of what their fruit is, mm -hmm. which is love, love right. for the saints. Right. And I think that that is an interesting contrast to the beginning of chapter 6 where it appears that those who'd fallen away, it was it was all just kind of this experiential part that didn't produce real fruit. Right. Um, but Paul is like reassuring them, you have fruit, right. and I see it, and you are even doing it to this very moment. Right. Um, so I just thought that that contrast is good to point out because I think oftentimes we read the first part of chapter six as a very frightful thing, and it should be warning. But Paul is like, but there's fruit in your life. There's evidence. Right. And I think I think about this too. Um, let's think of. I'm going to be careful. I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want to speak in a way that I'm. I, it sounds like I'm putting down other services or anything like that. But when I think about a, a church service where a preacher gets up and he talks about how. Uh, how God wants to bless you, how he wants to make you rich, how he wants to do this and do this for you, 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 you. And everybody's just going, yeah. And they're going, do you want more? Yeah. And it's just going crazy and it's emotional. Everybody's excited. They can go to church there for 10 years. But have they ever gone out and done what we just talked about? Right. Have they, the real fruit of, because you love Christ, you go out and you help people who have nothing. See, when 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 a when a message is being told, give your money to me, and God will bless you. You're not giving to the poor. You're giving to a preacher who has way too much money, so you can be rich like him. Where is the fruit of the faith? Where is love for the least of these? It's not there anywhere. It's it's very much all about the love of money. The ministers loving money and the people who are listening and giving their money and sowing to him are loving money and wanting what he has. 
So they, this is the type of situation that easily could be an example of those who will one day, and I'm not saying everybody who attends a church like that is lost and going to hell, but I'm saying there's a great deception when you're in, quote, the house of God, a man of God is reading the Bible to you, quoting verses to you, getting you excited about Jesus and you're jumping around, but you really have never experienced salvation and there really is no fruit being born in your life. You are very emotional, very excited. You're, you talk about gifts, you see gifts. Maybe you're acting like you've got gifts. I don't know. But he's saying, look, you're going to be the ones that say, depart, I never. I'm, that's what he's going to say. I didn't know you. You were hyped up about money in my name and cars in my name and jets in my name and houses in my name and victory in my name and all these things but you didn't know me because if you knew me you would love the least of these that's the fruit of knowing him is you really will give self-sacrificially not to make some rich guy richer but you'll go and give to someone who can't give anything back to you listen that's right out of the bible when you go and you give to those who cannot give back to you, that's when you get rewards in heaven. When you give to some guy on TV because he says he's going to give back to you, you've given with the motivation to get something. But when you go give to someone, a little widow or a poor person on the street, they'll never be able to repay you. There is no promise of you being made wealthy. There's no promise of anything. You are, and I love what he says there, the love which you have shown toward his name. It's love for his name. It's love for him that has caused you to go and give to others. That's the fruit of a good tree. And that you've done this, this to the least of these. Yes, exactly. Because, guys, this is, this is true Christianity here. Jesus gave his life for us. He, he gave up comforts. The apostles walked away from house and home, they say, to gain what he's going to give in heaven not to gain what can be on this earth. So this is the true fruit of loving him is loving the least and giving sacrificially and serving, not coming to be served, but coming to serve. And that's not what we hear sometimes out there in the world, even in the church. So we want to be careful and, and not just about a health and wealth gospel, but any any type of a service or place that's, that's a church that is is. Pushing a message about how you're going to be blessed. And it's only about you. I know that fills seats because everybody wants to hear how they're going to be blessed. But the real truth of the gospel is we need to understand that if we're going to truly receive the blessing of God that he does want to give us. It's going to come because we're doing what he said. We're obeying him. We're going out and we're. We're loving people and we're sharing Christ with people, which is what we're about to get into here. And spending time in the word at home. Yes, because all of this is about how we bear fruit. We have to have that truth in so us. So they don't know the difference. So there, on yes. the other hand, yes. I have been told, when you talk more about your church family than you do your own family, mm -hmm. your biological family, I said, I've got more in common with them. Yeah, right. I hate to say it, but I do. Yeah. Well, and, and Jesus never had a place to lay his head. No. That's right. what he said. Right. So Jesus wouldn't be flying in a jet because he wouldn't have a place to park it. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, and not only that, but you know, back back, I can remember when people when the question was out there, you know, what would Jesus do? And somebody asked me, well, would Jesus have a Rolex? No. <laughs> you know, I mean, Jesus had Peter. I think it's Peter that caught the fish to pay his taxes. It was it Andrew? One of those yes. guys. Peter. Peter, you know. Yeah. You know, if, if he was going to bless it with money. Yeah. And it's not, there's not a sin of being rich or having wealth. It's exactly. in loving it. Yeah. Exactly. If you love it, that's where the sin comes in. The, the root of all evil is the love of money. Okay, I'm going to break down something because I've, I want to make sure I'm understanding correctly. Okay. Past and now current. Yeah. You said, when you said that, like, um, I don't want to paraphrase what you said, but depart from me, I never knew you. You know, we're talking about the love of money and everything. Yeah. 
but if you're already in the book of the saved, right. you've already accepted, you've done all the, the steps. Yes. Are you still, I mean, can you be denied? Right, that's what I'm, I'm trying to, uh, I'm glad you're asking, so I wanna make sure everybody hears and gets this. What the scripture tells us from a passage in 1 John uh, to uh, the different things that we've been talking about uh, is if you truly have experienced salvation, you've get, been right. given eternal life, uh, the Bible says nothing can snatch you out of my hands. Jesus says it, and then he says nothing can snatch you out of the Father's hands. Um, John writes in his uh, little epistle, uh, those who went out from us, those who left the church and departed, the only reason they did apostatize themselves and leave the faith is because they were never truly a part of us. All right. So what I would say to you then is uh, your name was never written in the Lamb's Book of Life. You could have been in church for 10, 15 years, jumping around in services or in a quiet Baptist church and going through all the motions and listening in a class and being excited about uh, stuff that you're hearing or whatever emotion doesn't equate salvation emotion doesn't equate faith emotion is a good thing it's not a bad thing but just because we have an emotional experience doesn't mean we've put our faith in christ just because we believe that jesus is real and alive and things like that doesn't mean that we have put our faith in him for salvation once that happens, though, our name is written in that Lamb's Book of Life. And I, I believe it doesn't get erased. Um, I think it's there. I, I know that there are verses that talk about uh, names being blotted out and things. But I think we really have to be careful how we apply that in a broad spectrum. That, because otherwise, all of a sudden, our salvation begins to become by works. And that's, that's a slippery slope. If, if you are saved by grace, it's a gift of God through faith, uh, then to say, I maintain my salvation by doing good yeah. is going against being saved by faith alone, grace through faith alone. I, so I, you have to pick one camp or the other. You either say I'm saved by the works I do and I maintain my salvation by doing good, or you say you're saved by grace through faith, right? The Bible is very clear. I, I have no other standing. It's, it's very clear that we're saved by grace through faith alone. So when we talk about works like James talks about, faith that produces works is living faith. It's faith that can save you. But if you have a faith that does not produce works, that faith is dead faith and it cannot save you. And I think we know there is such a thing as people who have faith but it's not saving faith. And I won't try to parse out exactly what that is tonight, but does that help a little bit that yes. we, get, we shouldn't live in fear of losing if we've truly yeah. experienced salvation? Because you had me really scared like I'm going home tonight and selling off everything we own. <laughs> so. No, no, no. I want to make sure that I'm not I mean, saying it's, anything it's like that. It's a good that. thing to say, like, we, have a, we are very much okay with the idea of salvation by grace, right? That there's nothing that we can do to earn salvation. We can't merit that right. on our own. Right. But I think we also have to realize is that sanctification as well is of grace. Mm -hmm. But I think a lot of times we, we love the idea of salvation by grace, but then we often fall into the, the idea of sanctification by works. And that was what the Galatians fell into. But what's interesting about that is a person who is saved will produce works. Right. And that is the evidence of being saved, right. not the means right. to getting saved. Um, and so, yeah, like someone who's truly saved, the grace that began the work will finish the work. Yeah. And there will be nothing, heaven and earth, angels, principalities, powers, life, death, that will ever separate that. He who began a good work it's will faithful. complete it. So I think that's the idea. And one thing to remember, too, when Paul wrote this, Paul knew that he was needing to address that. He needed to address this very thing because there were many people that were a part of the faith that departed. Mm -hmm. You know, and that they thought, like, I thought these people were with us and Christians. And, and so Paul's having to address this, and I think he's, in one way, offering them, yes, you need to take warning. 
right? You need to take heed of your own faith. But he's also at the same task with comforting, mm -hmm. you know, people that were afraid, you know, like, wait, what? You know, I mean, even the disciples thought that when Jesus said, one of you will betray me, none of them knew who it would be. They all were like, is it me? Right. So I think Paul knew that he had to address this both by providing warning and comfort. And I love the way that he does it. He says, but concerning you, there's great evidence, your love. And ministering to the saints at that time came with great, like, danger, you know, because they were persecuted. So this idea of, like, ministry, I think what it's said here means so much more than we often think of it as Americans. Like, to truly minister to the people at this time meant a lot. Um, and that they were subjecting themselves to persecution and danger. And so Paul is like, look, the fruit of God is definitely in your life. Well, uh, and, but there will be those that yeah. fall away. Right. And they released that uh, statistic that out of everybody who calls themselves Christians in America, only 8% have been truly born again and had a changed life. Eight. Is that eight? So you... Did you get the statistic from American Family Association? Okay. They had some study they released. It was the yeah. same study that said out of all the pastors of a Christian church in America, only 38% preach the gospel or believe in the yeah. gospel. America has drastically changed in the last several decades. And we, what, is, what we are actually living in the day of is what Jesus prophesied in Matthew 24, the apostasy of the church, the great falling away. And, and we think... It's easy for us to, like what Eric was just asking about, it's easy for us to think, well, so are we going to, many of us who are saved are going to just lose our salvation? But it's, what it is, is many who uh, were a part of the Christian worship services and church were really not a part of the church. They really were not a part of the body of Christ. And so we, we're seeing that. We're living in that very day where you can't even get 10%. And in the entire nation of America that have experienced salvation that that bears fruit in their life. And so that is a great falling away, a great falling away where the church is becoming more an apostate church than it is a true church. Now, it doesn't mean that the true church is not in existence. By no means, the body of Christ is alive and well on planet Earth. But in the Western world, the church has been growing in a more an apostate position and status versus say the church in India or uh, in other parts of the world, China, Iraq, uh, parts of Africa where you, you just see uh, real faith in the midst of great persecution. They're, they're living it out, though it costs them everything. That's very different than people who show up, go through the motions on a Sunday, but live like the devil all week long. That's, that's someone who thinks they're going to heaven who is not going to heaven. You are most likely, because there's no fruit of righteousness in their life, but they play the game of religion. And so, um, and that will include many pastors, as you said. Sadly, many, many false shepherds and false teachers will also think that they were saved. They, they're wearing a collar, they went to seminary, whatever, but that doesn't make you born again. This is a very real subject that we should all take seriously. Being born again is, is the only thing that saves us. Um, nothing else does. Isn't that where Satan would just love us to be? Thinking you're saved. Oh, yeah. And going through right. the motions. It's the greatest deception of all because how do you repent if you don't think you need to? Exactly. But if you'll read his word and let his spirit do his work, you will recognize the sin that you're walking in, the sinful lifestyles, the rebellion against his word, the denying of his truths. If, if you can see that, that is fruit of your father, the devil, not your father, God. Well, and that's quoting Jesus again. And, you know, going back to a little of what Mark was saying, and then I'm going to try to get us further in our passage. But Jesus was talking about this before Paul was ever born again. Jesus is the one telling us about the four soils, the one, the one good soil that bears much fruit and the others that don't or completely are uprooted. 
Um, Jesus is the one telling us what will happen to trees that bear no fruit. that will be thrown into fire. Jesus speaks about this all through the Gospels repeatedly. Probably more than Paul or anybody else. He is trying to tell us something. Do not just think that because you said some little prayer at a certain age or because you attend a building and because you like the songs, don't think that because of that you are a Christian. He tells you very clean, you must be born again. Amen. You cannot inherit eternal life unless you are born again. Jesus makes that so plain and he says it more than John 3. He says it throughout the Gospel of John. It's where the apostles get It's, their it's exactly where they get the whole phrase and everything. Yeah. You must experience salvation. Being born again is not a religious thing of walking forward and saying a prayer. Being born again is an actual spiritual, miraculous work of God where you are transformed from death to life. Amen. That's what it is. If that miracle hasn't happened, you're not born again. Only God can cause us to be born again. We can't do it to ourselves. And going to church and repeating things after other people doesn't make us born again. It is a work of God. When we begin to really think on this, there should be a desperation that comes over there. The, anybody listening that says, God in heaven, I want to be born again. I want to be saved. I, I am a sinner. I need you. I believe you died and you were buried and you rose again for my salvation. Come and save me. He says to all who call in the name of the Lord, they shall be saved. He doesn't make it difficult. But when we come to him only wanting something for us and we're not giving our life to him. Remember, he says, anyone that will come after me, let him take up his cross. Let him count the cost because true salvation is going to mean giving up your life. So that you bear fruit. True salvation is going to be a heart that is ready to not just experience the forgiveness of sins, but press on to maturity. It's, it's going to include all of that, that work of God inside of us. Or do you follow me because you ate of the loaves? And the yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Do you come to church because... You get great child care and your kids are learning morals. And, you know, why, why do you come? Because we have lights and we have all these things. And uh, you can, your business can grow. There's pastries and good coffee. And why do you go to church? I mean, a lot of people go to church because it's a social thing. It's And they're getting good morals and they feel better about themselves because their grandparents went. But they really haven't let themselves surrender to Christ. They're just going through the motions. It's a very scary thing. The conversation between Christ and Nicodemus is a perfect oh, example of that. Yeah. It is yes. a perfect example yeah. of that. And the mm -hmm. irony of what Nicodemus suggests, like, wait, are you saying that a man yeah, should vacuum. enter into his mother's womb mm -hmm. again? The yeah. irony is that that is actually more possible than what Jesus is suggesting, to be born of the Spirit, to just clearly highlight that it is purely a miraculous work that only God can do. And that entering into your mother's womb again is actually more possible <laughs> than a man just saying, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> But that's the irony of it. It's like, it's a, that is actually more possible than a man being born of his own will, born again. And so, yeah, I think what you're talking about, I think this, the conversation between Nicodemus and Jesus is a perfect example because Nicodemus was a good man. Yeah. And he was a and righteous he was a, man. a religious man. He had the word, yeah. the law, and he loved God in in a, in a respect. But he was missing yes. the son. Mm -hmm. But he had sense enough to seek him out. Yeah, yeah, he did. And and because of Nicodemus's love for God, God revealed Himself yes, to Nicodemus, he does. and Nicodemus was given the truth of how to be born again. Mm -hmm. so I think anyone that Nicodemus yes, he came, right? yeah, and I think that any of us that truly love the Lord. If you love him, he's going to make sure that you you understand. He's the one who gives us understanding. No man can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. So the mercy and love of God comes to little children and they're born again. This is not rocket science. How many of us were saved as children? I was nine. Oh, so we have dad, Carlos. My wife was saved at, I think, seven. Quincy at five. I mean, 
You really don't have to have all understanding of everything in the Bible. You have to understand you're a sinner and call on him for salvation. And it can happen to us at all different ages. Um, but it is it is a work of the Lord. Mm, five minutes. <laughs> Let me see if I can. Uh, we're not going to get as far near as far as what I thought tonight. But uh, that may it may be just just as well because of. Uh, the subject we're about to get into, it's going to tie into everything we've been talking about. But um, I'm afraid if I jump off right now uh, any further, it's going to be real hard to... I'm going to have to repeat what we've said next week anyways. Um, let's see. Let's just go ahead and read verse 11 and, and 12 and talk about it for the next... Five minutes, and then uh, we'll, we'll just have to repeat some of it to to really uh, get us back on track for going into verse thirteen. But he says, "And we desire." Remember, he just talked about how I know that you all. Uh, I'm not talking about you when I talk about people who aren't saved or going to fall away. You, on the other hand, uh, you bear this good fruit of loving God and taking care of the saints and so on. He says, "And we desire that each one of you show." the same diligence so as to realize the full assurance of hope until the end. So what that's saying to us is <clears throat> that the writer, Paul, is saying that we desire that each one of you show the same diligence. That would be perseverance, pressing on, right? Um, so as to realize the full assurance of hope until the end. So that you, you, you press on with diligence to get to mature in the faith, to get the full assurance of hope. Your, our hope is not just eternal life. Our hope is growing in Christ, producing fruit, seeing many, many souls come to faith in Christ. This is the hope should be the hope of every believer is that we we want to reproduce and we want to do what our father has told us to do go and make disciples of all nations we don't want to be given charge of of uh, 10 minus and 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 bury right we want to make more with it we don't want to be given five and and bury you know there's the, the guy who was given one is the only one who really buried it everybody else reproduced double what they were given and we want to be that. He says, uh, we desire that each one of you show the same diligence so as to realize the full assurance of hope until the end. Press on all the way to the end. Press on to maturity. Press on to that perfection all the way in so that you will not be sluggish. <laughs> There's that thing, right? So that you will not uh, get delivered out of Egypt, move into the promised land and go, Oh, we made it to the land flowing with milk and honey. Oh, yeah, there's giants over there, but as long as they don't mess with me, I'm not going to mess with them. Right? Walt says, I, I don't want to break a sweat. As long as I got my grapes here, everything's good. Right? And, and, and so Jesus says, that's not what I saved you for. I didn't take the children of Israel out of Egypt to bring them into a land and not fully accomplish what I put in them to accomplish, what I promised them to accomplish. No, I gave them the land so they would know me. Amen. How are they going to know him by him giving them the land? Because he's requiring them to put their faith in him in order to get what he promised them. If they don't put their faith in him, they don't even get to enter it. What is God's heart for all of us? That we would trust him. Because that's the heart of the relationship. That's what we're going to talk a lot more about next week.